we've discussed the basics of sensation and perception, we're going to move on to talk about some basic thresholds in sensing uh, this external stimuli around us. And so when we mean the thresholds, we're really talking about how much of something has to exist around us for us to pick up on it. And the very lowest level is what's called our absolute threshold. So the absolute threshold is something that's been discovered for, for quite some time. And it may surprise you at just how low these thresholds are. And so two psychologists that worked in this area were Gustav Fechner and Weber, uh, and they did extensive studies on how low could you go. Keep in mind, this is before we had smartphone screens and laptop screens and huge CFL light bulbs. They were working in Austria in the 1800s, and they discovered that on a dark night with no wind, not a lot of stars, uh, if you lit a candle 50 kilometers away, that's not a typo, it's not supposed to be 50 meters, it's not supposed to be five kilometers, 50 kilometers away, um, could the person tell when the candle was lit versus when the candle was not lit? And they found beyond the chance of error, beyond, beyond a random chance, uh, that they could detect when a candle was lit 50 kilometers away, provided there was no other light disturbances. They must have found a great big field somewhere. Uh, and so they were able to detect that. And so of course we can, we would not be able to sense this in a large city to, nowadays because there's so much light pollution, uh, it'd be really hard to sense that. But they also found that with no other distractions, we could hear a, wa a watch ticking from six meters away. So with no other sounds, no ventilation or furnaces or appliances humming in the background, we could hear a watch tick from six meters away. We also could find that if you had uh, 7.5 liters of water, so if you think about a two liter uh, milk carton, for instance, you'd need almost four milk cartons of water. And if you just put five milliliters of sugar in that water, we can detect when the sugar's there versus when the sugar's not there. Also, if you have a roommate who uses love perfume or cologne, uh, it may come to no surprise to you that one drop, one from an eyedropper of perfume can be detected in a six room apartment. And so that is quite substantial. Our sense of smell is often more sensitive than we, than we get let on. Although we're not the most sensitive compared to other species, we can still detect quite a lot, quite, quite a minuscule amount of smell. And then with our sense of touch, well, what we actually find is without actually coming in contact with our body, uh, we can detect a butterfly wing flapping one centimeter from our skin. That's enough to, to really pick up on the motion of the, of the breeze, uh, if you will. And you don't have to come in contact with the butterfly's wing. So this is the absolute threshold. So we know that our nervous system, we know that our sensory organs are pretty, pretty in tune if it can pick up on this small of, of, of stimuli. That being said, we live in very complex worlds where we're not living in isolated fields with no noises. And so when do we notice when things change? Uh, as we're living in a city with lots of lights, when do we notice when lights go on or lights go off? Well, for this, we look to a different threshold called the just noticeable difference threshold. And so uh, if you remember Gustav Fechner, who was mentioned as going blind in unit one, history of psychology, and some people say he went blind because he spent way too much light, way too much time focusing on candles. Uh, though of course that is debatable. But what we find here with the just noticeable difference is the smallest detectable increase that we can determine. We can certainly notice the difference when one candle is lit versus zero. And when a second candle is lit, we can see the difference between that and just one. When there's five candles lit and we add a six, we can also detect that difference. And when there's 10 candles lit and we add an 11th, we can detect the difference. But they find that once you get beyond 30 candles, that is the less than 1 30th of an increase from the initial stimulus, um, then we start to find that we can't detect the difference. So this is, this is really interesting. This means that we can detect the 29th candle and the 30th candle, but not the 31st candle. So this is when things start to become imperceptible to us. There is a difference, but our nervous system cannot pick it up. And, and, and so this is really important because this lets us know that there can be changes in our environment, but if they're smaller than that ratio of 1 30th, we may not be able to pick them up. And so this lets us know uh, that when we perceive magnitude of brightness of things or loudness of things or uh, the, the potency of certain types of smells, that this is 
not always going to be completely objective, but the magnitude we perceive things are actually the number of just noticeable differences above the absolute threshold. That is, our perception of brightness doesn't tend to be uh, linear with the absolute number of candles, but it tends to be in relation to the number of just noticeable differences past the absolute threshold. So a little bit of a different calculation there. We'll see this come into play more, more often when we talk about sound and loudness and decibels. So now that we've talked about these basic thresholds for sensation, that is the absolute threshold and the just noticeable difference, it's important to talk about some other complex phenomena, one of them being the subliminal per perception. And so subliminal perception is perception without awareness. Sometimes subliminal perception happens even though uh, it's above the absolute threshold because so much is happening in the context. One example of this is flashes in videos. Oftentimes when you're watching a movie, there's so much happening, there's so much visual stimuli and voices and plots and sounds, you can't take in everything. And one thing that many moviegoers didn't even realize till it was brought to their attention was in the 1900s, uh, before digital movie theaters, uh, what we often had was at the end of a film reel, you would see a dark oval in the upper right corner of the film screen. Now, some people would notice this, but it would flash so instantaneously, many moviegoers were oblivious to this happening. Uh, and so they would not detect it, it didn't distract them from the movie. Some scenes in the movie would have a couple little scratches, but you would get away with not really focusing on that. Uh, and so there would be many things you wouldn't even detect. Oftentimes it's just that we're inattentive to things such as certain scores or soundtracks in a movie. You may not know when you're watching it, but then when it's played back, you're like, oh yeah, I recognize that sound now. And so because of this, in movies, we started to see product placement. Uh, and so product placement is the idea that certain branded objects we placed into a movie, and then not for helping the plot along, just as sort of background images, the idea that now you're going to see more of the brand, and the more of the brand you're going to see, the more we tend to like the brand. Um, and so by inserting products into a movie, it's the idea of advertising that brand. So this is all above the absolute threshold, but it's not something we tend to focus on. And if you were questioned after watching a film, you may not remember the products, you may not remember certain sounds or certain flashes, but it's all things that your nervous information did take in. And in other types of tests, we can draw out what you did see. Sometimes subliminal perception is of course below the absolute threshold. And this is the idea that when you go into a room and you're intentionally trying to smell for a certain scent or look for an object, you can't see it. You can't see it, but it's still impacting your behavior. And so an example of this is if we put a tiny drop of very diluted scent into a room, such as a citrus scent, and it's so below our absolute threshold that we can't actually smell oranges, for some reason, beyond reason of chance, uh, people will tend to be more tidy. We'll talk about this more in unit five on consciousness, but just be aware there are some things that are below our absolute threshold that our sensory information is not aware of picking up, we're not conscious of, but it's still influencing us in an unconscious way. Then of course we have sensory adaptation. There's so much going on in our world every day, we cannot pay attention to everything and we have to make decisions about what to pay attention to. And this is sensory adaptation. So this is the idea over time we tend to become desensitized to things that we find are not harmful and less informative. And so these could be things like the sound of a laptop, the sound of a refrigerator, though if our appliances do become louder or sound differently than they're used to, we will pick up on that. But as long as they stay the same, we tend to neglect uh, and become desensitized to them. Of course, much of psychology's history has been concerned with the idea we're becoming, we're becoming desensitized to violence through being exposed to violence, not just through video games and movies, but through the news. And as many mainstream news media have become just um, tragedy stories, we may become desensitized to the human nature of what's going on in those stories. Now, uh, the opposite of desensitization, of course, is sensitization. And this is the idea that over time, we may attune our nervous system to become more responsive and more aware to certain external stimuli. So this is the idea that if you change the ringtone on your phone, you may become more sensitized to that ringtone over time, and you may be more alert every time you hear that. Or if you're a new parent and you're trying to watch and listen for your child, uh, you may become more sensitized to the sounds of their murmurs and cries uh, and so that you will become awakened even in a deep sleep. 
And so within your kitchen, there's certain things you're probably becoming desensitized and sensitized to at all times. You're probably becoming desensitized to the sound of the fridge. You might be becoming desensitized to the sound of the range hood, but you may become sensitized to the sound of the microwave dinging, letting you know uh, that your reheated meal is ready. So there's all kinds of things that we change our sensitivity to and we adapt to in different ways. Now, sometimes we experience what's called sensory deprivation. This is a really unique phenomenon, and it's the idea that you are placed in a space with a lack of sensory input. Uh, this is boredom to its extreme. And so uh, an example of modern day sensory deprivation is common leisure float tanks. These are the ideas you can go into these float tanks and there's a saline pool and you can choose to listen to music or choose to have aromatherapy or choose to not. Uh, and if you choose to not have any sensory information, what happens is uh, you're floating in a float tank, so there's no new touch information. It's dark, so there's no new visual information. If you're not listening to music, there's no auditory information. If you're not using aromatherapy or if the aromatherapy is pretty stable after time, you become uh, ad adapted and desensitized to that, so there's no new sensory information. You're not eating anything, and uh, your sense of balance is, off, is, is stable because you're floating. And this lack of sensory input, what we actually find uh, is that if you were to stay in a float take long enough, because there's a lack of information being brought to your brain, your brain may spontaneously uh, start to light up and create its own neural impulses. Uh, and so this is what we would see as hallucinations. You may get auditory hallucinations or visual hallucinations. Um, and of course, there's individual thresholds for this. We tend to find that introverted people that prefer to be alone and who are often overstimulated to start with, a float tank is gonna be very relaxing to them. They can think about their thoughts, they have a huge internal world they have to work through, and they're not going to hallucinate right away. It's a time for them to actually clear their minds. And so they're, they're gonna be thinking about lots of things. Versus people on more extroverted or outgoing ends of the spectrum, they're going to be um, more looking for that outward external stimulation and that lack of external stimulation uh, is going to make them more likely to hallucinate at a faster rate. Though if kept in the, in the float tank long enough, even the most introvert of introverts will eventually hallucinate. Uh, and so it has to be done under safe parameters and it's recommended that you don't do this for too long your first time, uh, but it is something that, that individuals can experience.